thank you very much, Comrade Chris, for that great talk. Uh, we are now open to discussion. If friends want to ask question or raise a point, please raise your hand and, you know, you can unmute your own video and your own audio. Whilst people uh, make up their mind to raise their hand, uh, I just wanted to ask you one question, comrade. Uh, you started your talk by uh, mentioning the menstruation cycle and how important it was in the development of language. Uh, and then when Yasaman asked you a question, you sort of lost your chain of thought and went to the uh, hunter-gatherer type of approach. That, although you returned back to the question of menstruation cycle, I think you lost some of the logical steps in between. Uh, I wonder if you could sort of briefly, if time allowed, uh, sort of go over it again and join the two points together. Uh, I felt there was a gap after that question uh, in your sort of development of the logic of uh, language, as it were. Uh, you went to the question of cooperation, food gathering, all relevant to the problem of language, but you didn't actually go into details of it. I wonder if you could somehow sort of go over that again, because uh, it may have been lost to some of the listeners. Uh, Torab, you're absolutely right. I completely lost the plot. I don't. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think Yasmin might have been a lot more um, strict with me. <laughs> Um, so yeah, okay. Um, but I mean, obviously, it's just, it is a bit, um, you know, it's a complicated story in some ways. Although, I, I, let me just stress it: in some ways, it's very simple. The idea is that the first word was spoken by a woman, and that word was "no," and she was not alone. And that word was spoken in a way which was more than just verbal. It, no had to be spoken by that female coalition that I was talking about in language of dance and song uh, and ritual but, um, because a, a costly signal is was needed in view of the fact that in, in the period, as as culture is just beginning to emerge, the, the the biological male might have needed a little bit of convincing that the, the 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 word no, if you like, is not the word which the biological evolving human male is most keen to receive. And women, in saying no, no, no to sex for the period for now, may have to you know, mount a bit of a song and dance about it, repeat it a few times, say it quite loudly. And that and that's going to lead to more than just a verbal no with a sort of you know a, a, a consonant um, followed by a vowel. So the idea is that this was the first word, and it was a, a word of dance and sung in a chorus of defiance, linked with laughter, in, in the way that that Nagoku ritual so clearly um, illustrates. And then once you've got that first word, that word which kind of means everything, um, but means nothing in particular. Just, the, 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 just this this primordial, all-purpose, massive ritual uh, word, if you like, then under conditions as the ritual collapses, which I was talking about, how you you, you know you can't you can't remain in a state of communal effervescence all the time. You have your ritual, then you collapse back, and as you collapse back from that period of effervescence, you become individuals again. And you're separate individuals and you're each occupying a different portion of space and time and you might want to still want to know what's inside the head of some other person that you're, you're, you're you know you've got a relationship with at least you've got the materials of language you've, you've now got this very large um choral um ritual um, no but as that that can that can now be almost plundered fragmented into elements which can now be used uh, to, to to convey uh, details of of thought so the idea is that in order to have these cheap signals low-cost signals which we call words there has to be 
an enormous amount, of, in fact, an unprecedented amount of trust, unprecedented in, in all biological evolution. That's created by the ritual. But the ritual doesn't just do that. It also makes sure that everyone's, as a result of that ritual, in the same mental space. You all have the same, um, in the course of the ritual, we're all thinking the same thoughts, the same, we have the same goals. We sh if you'd like, share the same gods. God's not quite the right word, but we share the same Values, God, I think with hunter-gatherers, the, you know, the word God doesn't quite quite work. But 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 communication using language is now possible. Um, but in order for language, as as we understand it, to get off the ground, you have to be not singing, not dancing, not in the course of ritual. You have to be separate individuals. You only need language when you can't tell what's in somebody else's mind, but you want them to convey it. But at least now, as a result of the ritual, humans would have had the resources. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, that helped a lot. I see Camilla Power has raised her hand. Please take the mic and raise your question, Camilla. Um, oh, I was just going to add, because I'm Chris's colleague, um, that you were asking what connects menstruation to language. And what I'm getting from Chris is the whole issue for language is um, to overcome social conflict. And the point that I was making to Chris um, from early, many years ago, was that, uh, was that um, menstruation in amongst a, a social group of females is going to create conflict unless they develop strategies to overcome it. And that the ritual strategies that Chris is describing Oh, ways and means of overcoming that conflict. And that is the fundamental basis to be able to secure trust, to be able to secure linguistic forms of communication. In terms of the signaling that Chris has talked about, very costly signals compared to very cheap signals, because language, of course, has an incredible flow of extraordinary cheap signals that can be very easily ch you know change one word to another word and and what's the difference um but menstruation is like a pure gold it's pure gold because it implies the possibility of fertility and this is why it has so much power and so much importance and this is why it is down at the bottom of almost every religion on earth ever that menstruation and and the laws or rules governing menstruation are the fundamental of religion. Just wanted to add that. Thank you. That was very helpful. Comrade Chris, you want to comment on that or? Well, it's it's just that um, we think of menstrual taboos as sort of antithetical to religion. I mean, the world's when we think of the religion these days, we mostly think of religion to the book, and of course, far you know the, the, these religions, um, they they you know they 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 can hardly tolerate the very existence of the of 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 menstruation, and so you have this kind of you have this endless conflict between. The blood of women and and the sacred blood, and and yet it's so so clear, isn't it, that this that if you just ask a simple question, what is the deepest deepest ritual taboo in so many different cultures? Actually, even in the West today, this is, takes a slightly different form with us. But but menstruation is taboo, uh, except medically. So in in the West today, among scientists, you can talk about menstruation within a kind of medical context somehow to to deal with menstruation culturally and symbolically and to insert it back where it needs to be in the, in the history of religion as the sort of the, the, at the lying at the root of the sacred it's um it's always difficult because it, it there's, there's there, there are these patriarchal religious um inhibitions about going down that road and and of course you know there are there are fairly obvious reasons why um um you know why so yeah <laughs> It's, it's, I would just simply say it's hard. It's hard to be scientific here without being a revolutionary, and actually without being a Marxist in in these contexts, because you know, owing to the religious 
taboos all around us, which are still very much alive. <laughs> Thank you very much. That clarified it a lot. Uh, from what I understand, what you have said points out the fact that this uh, earlier sort of classic understanding on the Marxist left that human societies went through a whole period of matriarchal societies, which then led to, you know, a patriarchal counter-revolution is a bit oversimplistic. Human societies have evolved in a more complex way. Uh, sometimes, you know, mixing the two uh, at the same time. Uh, is that correct? Have I understood your argument correctly? Is that what you're saying? Well, yes, but I mean, my own view uh, is that Engels got it fundamentally right. Um, in other words, um, immediate return hunter-gatherers, hunter-gatherers that don't don't practice storage, um, tend to be um, matrilocal. Women, certainly when they have their first kid, choose to live with mum and therefore with sisters, and that enables the shared childcare that Sarah Hurdy talks about. So living with mum... In other words, residing matrilocally, Engels does talk about that. That's not the same thing as matriarchy, of course. But if you are, if women are living with their mother and therefore with their sisters, they will have solidarity and they will have a, a considerable, significant amount of power. Um, as for matriarchy, um, it's it's just true. And I, I even I don't even think Engels was really saying there was a time when women sort of ruled in anything like the way that men rule under patriarchy. Um, but so, I mean, what seems to be the case is that the hunter gatherers have this um, have this have this rhythm in their society, this periodicity, what Morna Finnegan calls communism in motion. So women just don't have any reason to 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 statically rule over men. It's much more, makes a lot more sense to take the power in a playful way um, and then surrender it. Because if you do that, if you keep seizing the power, surrendering it, seizing it, surrendering it, doing so in, in accordance with the, the rhythms of the moon in your own cycle, then the revolution is something which not only changes society, but actually becomes the basis of society because it, it doesn't, doesn't, doesn't become a memory. So what Morna calls communism in motion is, is the kind of communism which, which works. And so I'm, I'm agreeing with you that the word matriarchy doesn't quite cut it because it's a, it's a kind of periodic matriarchy alternating playfully with a with a with a, a you know with in, intervening periods of like let's pretend patriarchy the, but the patriarchy is never allowed to settle down into the kind of thing which we, of course we're all familiar with throughout the period of of of, of, of the existence of the state and and all and, and class society the thing, thing to do is just just allow the kind of the threat of the threat of patriarchy to to keep stimulating a new revolution so that the human revolution has this has this periodicity to it it's it's, it's not just a one-off thing it's something which actually the, the, the solidarity engendered through revolution becomes the way society itself is organized because it doesn't get it doesn't just become a memory if you only have one revolution after a while it's going to become a memory isn't it and then and then and then you know that's and, and yet you need the you need revolution in order to generate the solidarity to keep to keep society governed from the bottom up. So, yeah, it is more complex. You're right, yeah. Great. Uh, I see no hands up. Uh, if Persian friends want to ask question in Persian, they can write it in chat and we would translate it into English. Uh, I see nobody's hand up. I used the opportunity to ask you another question, Chris. Uh, you, you know, this is a great point uh, to raise in terms of human revolution, in terms of development of language. And of course, uh, you have also written a lot of books on the actual theory of language. Uh, and you have debated a number of, you know, uh, other linguistic uh, philosophers and theoreticians of, uh, you know, fame including and especially Noam Chomsky. Uh, I wondered if you could uh, also sort of, if it's not too irrelevant to the talk today, uh, go a bit over that question, question of 
actually is uh, some of the theories behind the concept of language. Uh, I take it from you that you don't at all agree with uh, universal grammar or universal structures for language, human language. Is that correct or am I mistaken? Well, let, 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 let me say that I, I, I completely agree with Chomsky on a very fundamental point because there was a time when language was treated as learned behavior. And so it was argued that a child learns the grammar of its um, native language much as a, as a laboratory rat in a, in a maze learns through reward and punishment how to, how to navigate its, its, its maze. So languages like learn behavior. This was the this was the um, the behaviorist model um, sponsored in in America by somebody called B. F. Skinner, of course. Now Chomsky paved the way in 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 in, in, in stressing absolutely correctly that language is a, a critical component of human nature. Every child is born with something like an instinct to acquire its native language. And all of us who, who, who watch kids of like 18 months, two years, two and a half years old, I mean, it's just so extraordinary how that child is so, so imaginative and creative and it kind of acquires language as if it sort of knew the basics already. And, and as, it, as it invents brilliantly creative imaginative sentences, it's, it's like more comes out than goes in. And there's no way that it can be right that somehow <laughs> what comes out of that child's mouth as it's acquiring its language is, is what was put in through through reward and punishment. I mean that was a that was a that behaviorism was a was a horrendous, nonsensical idea. And Chomsky liberated us all from it by putting back language as a, as a critical component of human nature. In fact, the one part of human nature which perhaps more than any other um defines our our humanity. Um, now, but clearly, I mean, as you're you're right, I've I've written a, a lot about Noam Chomsky, and it, and it's been a bit of a difficult relationship with him. So just just very briefly, one one th another thing I have in common with Noam is that we both believe in revolution. Um, at least, I mean, I'm not quite sure how much Chomsky believes in revolution in political terms. Uh, you know, in in, in you know in, in in recent decades, but certainly as far as language is concerned. He he treats the emergence of languages not, not just revolutionary, but but astonishingly revolutionary. He 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 his theory is that one day some kind of um half half ape, half human moving around somewhere, I think in, I think he means in Africa. Um, um he, he called this individual Prometheus, by the way. One day he, this individual was um was was struck by some cosmic rays. There was a, a, a supernova explosion at some part of the universe, and it it sent cosmic rays towards planet Earth, and and these triggered a a, a macro mutation in this individual's head, and as a result of that, it, this mutation installed a fully functioning language organ in that individual's head, whereupon that individual began, as in his own words, talking to itself. So, I mean, what, what's clear about Chomsky's position on everything is that it, language isn't social. It's not communicative. It's a form of computation. And every, every, every all political social significance is, is stripped away from language. It becomes, it becomes, it becomes thinking. And, and he, he really stresses that this is I language, individual thinking. Language is for thinking to yourself. Um, and then he sort of says that um, thousands of years later, yes, you know, people, you know, humans began sort of working out different ways, which he's not interested in, of actually sharing their thoughts using e-language, by which he means external language. Um, so, I, I mean, what, I, what I've tried to do is instead of just treating all this as kind of nonsense, I mean, it, it is nonsense, but instead of just dismissing it as nonsense, I've tried to work out what can possibly have happened in, in the in the case of Noam Chomsky, to to push him into stripping away all social dimensions and all politics from linguistics, um, and and of course, as as I'm sure you know, um, some of you may have you know read read my book on on all this. 
the, 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 I mean, I, I, obviously, it's not the, it's not exactly um, you know today's topic, but um, here we had Noam Chomsky, who who began his career as a young Jewish left, very left wing intellectual, did absolutely detesting the U.S. military, shocked at what the Americans had done in Hiroshima with a nuclear bomb, employed at Massachusetts Institute of Technology to work on military um, navigation, command and control. Um, systems and so we have this this anti-militarist working for the military and you can't really do that without sort of splitting yourself in two and the way Chomsky resolved the contradictions was to make sure that his work for the military had no connection whatever with his politics in fact his his the, the, and his work for the military was it, it was it was it's supposed to be designing a system for commanding and controlling um w weapons in, initially during the vietnam war and um it was just essential for chomsky to remove all politics from that version of language because any any politics would have been the wrong sort of politics it would, it would have been very reactionary u.s militaristic politics and so he just stripped language of any political dimensions, as a result of which, in my own view, you don't any longer have language. But what you might have, it didn't actually work, is a way of um, tapping into a keyboard to make sure that your um, guided missiles uh, reach their target. Um, and, and along with that came his, his idea that language itself inside the human brain is one of those digital computers inside the head of each human is a digital computer much like the computers that he was he was he was he was helping to or, or, or employed to help um design in the early years of the computer revolution so somehow the uh, he had to strip his linguistics of all politics he also, by the way, stripped his politics of all linguistics. You'll never find him appealing to his linguistic theories in, during his in, in his political activism. So to keep the whole thing, keep the two sides of his work poles apart. Um, in my own view, much to the much to the detriment of both sides of his work. Even though, of course, you know, he he. I mean, we, we no question about it today with what's going on in Gaza in the Middle East. Um, we we very much miss Chomsky. He's as, as I'm sure all of you know, he hasn't been at all well in the last year. Um, and we haven't heard from him. He, he's clearly very ill, and uh, we miss his voice. His voice is a voice of astonishing clarity um, in in, a, in an increasingly deranged world. His one voice was just so so loud and clear on on issues which matter that we we sorely miss him. But his linguistics, I'm afraid, was extraordinarily um, misleading, governed as it was by the priorities of the U.S. military, uh, to which he was politically completely, of course, uh, opposed. <clears throat> and and uh, perhaps I'll just add to that, I mean, you, are, you asked about different theories of grammar. The, 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 the Chomsky's version was called, was called, it went through a whole number of different stages. Perhaps the best known is called um, transformational grammar. But as you say, the idea is that this, uh, there's this thing called universal grammar, which is the underlying computer code, if you like, of all the world's different languages. Much more influential these days is something called construction grammar um and and i'm a i'm a i'm a, a follower i suppose of this t these days prevailing theoretical paradigm where um there's, there's not a kind of grammar module in our head um and and, and and we have a very different way of accounting for 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 grammar i mean you know, I, I could explain, but but probably not the topic for for this 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 discussion. Thank you very much. Hopefully, maybe we can have you in future to go over the language properly because it's the yes, language I, itself. Yes, it, was, it was very inadequate. My touching on language is extremely impoverished on um, on in this particular version of my my talk. I apologize for that. No, but you've written extensively on this question, so it would be great if we could have you at a later stage to go over all this. Yeah. But anyway, I don't see any hands up. Well, that's a shame. Uh, 
I don't want to abuse your patience and ask another question. So I thank you for accepting our invitation and I congratulate you on a great talk. I'm sure most of our Iranian comrades and colleagues would enjoy your talk and I'm sure we would have a lot of feedback on this. Uh, thank you again and thank you all the friends who have joined us for this forum and uh, hopefully we see you again. Okay, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Good night, everybody.